So since um, uh, you'll be nice to me then. Yeah. So we're now. <laughs> oh, Lindsay's here. Oh, oh, there we are. We're it. now live. So not a moment too soon. Hi everyone. Welcome to this latest UK and a Changing Europe lunch hour. Perfect timing, Lindsay. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're to, uh, we're delighted to be joined by not one but two ambassadors today. Lindsay, who's just appeared on your screen, is the UK ambassador to the European Union, and Pedro Serrano is the EU's ambassador to the UK, and they are joined by none other than our own Catherine Barnard, who you will all already know. We're going to follow the usual format today, which is we'll start off with a brief conversation. I will try and get to as many of your questions as possible. As ever, if you can vote for the questions you want me to pose to the panel, that makes my life a lot easier and saves me having to scroll up and down. If you could also bear in mind that we have two ambassadors on the panel, so shouting about Brexit is not something that I'm necessarily going to pass on. There is a limit because of their jobs to the sorts of things they can answer. So if you can just think about that when posting your questions, you'll increase the chances of your question actually <clears throat> making it into the session. But without further ado, welcome all of you. And I just want to kick you off with you know a moment of reflection for each of you, which is, where are UK EU relations now? What sort of state are they in, do we think? And you can go in any order, except Catherine goes last. I'm happy to go first or Lindsay, um, whichever. Go for it, Pedro. Okay, th thanks so much. Well, I, I think we are in a good place in EU UK relations. I think um, 2023 was a good year, and that's how I usually call it in all the talks I, I attend a good year in EU UK relations. Trust was reestablished with the agreement on the Windsor framework and uh, a good mechanism to address uh, um, Northern Irish uh, issues. Um, so, uh, and from there, most of what still needed to be implemented within the trade and cooperation agreement has. Uh, been implemented. Um, uh, the UK has joined uh, important programs like uh, Horizon and 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 Euratom. Um, uh, sorry, and Copernicus. Uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, there has been an agreement on um, um, cooperation or not cooperation on on a dialogue on financial regulation. We have a forum established. It's working. We have agreed to relaunch uh, discussions on. Um, counterterrorism, on cybersecurity, formal dialogues. Uh, we have quite a fluid, um, uh, I would say, uh, quite fluid exchanges on international matters and security matters, uh, because it's true that while um, that this is not only uh, the, the improvement of relations, not only a factor of bilateral uh, interest and engagement, it's also a factor of uh, the international uh, community and all the challenges that the international community is uh, throwing at us, not only um, the uh, war uh, that uh, Russia is waging in Ukraine uh, against the Ukraine, um, uh, but also more uh, strategic challenges, uh, more broad strategic challenges. Now, more recently, um, the terrible situation in the Middle East after the horrible um, uh, Hamas attacks on the 7th of October and war going on in, in Gaza and the need to ensure that this doesn't escalate into broader conflicts. And in all these issues, uh, the EU and the UK have common interests and want to work together and uh, and are working actually together. We share um, security interests, we share economic interests, uh, we share uh, values and democracy. And I think um, 2023 has been a year where this has been really at the front of the relationship, where we've um, overcome uh, I would say um, tensions uh, um, over Brexit. Brexit, uh, obviously, um, uh, it's a divorce, and, and divorce always creates some um, uh, difficulties amongst those that are uh, um, uh, divorcing themselves. But I think afterwards you can rebuild a new relationship, and we are rebuilding a new and strong relationship on the basis of the trade and cooperation agreement and the withdrawal agreement. And of course, as I said, our common interests, uh, be it security, economic, or or Mm -hmm. uh, political uh, interest. Thank you. Lindsay, welcome again. Great. Thank you, Anand. Uh, and nice to be here. Um, uh, can I just check, Anand, you can hear me properly? Yeah. I was having some connection difficulties. Great. Um, well, so the starting point, which we wouldn't have said a year or two ago, is I agree with Pedro. Uh, I mean, he's <laughs> very much captured uh, kind of where we are now. And I think the reasons for that are, first and foremost, I think you have to start with the Windsor framework. 
we couldn't, I think, on either side have a positive, as positive a relationship as we would want, while there was a strong sense on both sides that the Northern Ireland arrangements were not working in a way that worked for both parties. For us, it was critical, the flexibilities that the Commission showed around the Windsor framework and the Council, and critical that we could be confident that we can provide the goods that we need to into Northern Ireland and that the economic links between uh, Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom remain strong. And I think with the Windsor framework, we found a way of resolving a set of issues around that, but equally important, finding mechanisms to talk about how we resolve some of the challenges that will arise in the future. So that has been a very mm -hmm. positive base and was really important, as you all know, from watching this relationship for the last few years. Of course, the work continues on getting the Northern Ireland exec executive back up and running, and we can come back to that in questions if people want to. So that allowed us, I think, both sides to move on to maximising the impacts on the t from, from the TCA. Uh, and I think Pedro set out the, the core areas. We've got these dialogues, the Financial Services Forum. Uh, all of that is very important. And there is, I think, the biggest thing this year since the Windsor Framework has obviously been what I think is a really important strategic set of links on Horizon and Copernicus. Um, looking ahead, I think that there are things that we can continue to do and that we were doing, which weren't necessarily within the framework of the TCA, but were about the kind of bilateral cooperation on international issues that Pedro's talked about. Mm -hmm. Particularly, I think Ukraine was a huge wake up call for both sides that we, you know, there was so much that we shared in this relationship, we really couldn't afford to, to not be working as close as, as closely as we could on Ukraine. And, the same is true on the Middle East and a, a wide range of other international challenges. So that's all really good. Uh, looking ahead, I think I anticipate that we'll have a very positive partnership council in the next few months. I think that will look again at the issues of whether we can do more on energy and electricity trading within the TCA. I think there's more scope to, to use the, what's agreed in the TCA to do a bit more on health. We could also continue working and take a step forward on uh, competition cooperation. Uh, by that, I mean the sort of um, uh, DG competition type, uh, you, you know, ensuring that we all have fair markets. So there's a lot that we'll be able to do moving forward as well, using both the frameworks of the TCA and the kind of partners in international forum, including the G7, that we've been building the last few years. So I do think it's genuinely both stable and a very positive trajectory and you can see that reflected in the in the words that the prime minister has used about what the kind of mature relationship he wants and also in the kind of approach that david cameron has taken since since becoming foreign secretary thank you interesting just just to push you both before i come to you catherine i mean you ended with by saying lindsay which is interesting that you think this now looks stable. Would, would I be right in assuming that you both think we've reached a kind of stable equilibrium, that this could be how it is, that actually there are no great uncertainties, insecurities or anything like that now, and this is the baseline for relations going forward and a stable one at that? So what I would say is that the, the EU-UK relationship is tremendously important and tremendously rich, and... That means that whenever we look at international policy challenges, of course, there are things we can do more on together and the relationship can evolve. A good example of that is the EU's carbon border adjustment mechanism, mm -hmm. as co of course, as one of the EU's closest neighbours and this uh, country that has very similar climate change objectives. We are we're now committed to introducing mm -hmm. our own carbon border adjustment mechanism. And I think those are examples of the kind of, if you, if you work from the basis that we had a stable relationship based in a free trade agreement, you can then discuss how you make the, the sort of dynamic regulatory changes that each of us are, are working on, how you can ensure that we cooperate as partners, third countries clearly, but as partners on those kinds of issues. Which is a great segue for me to say, look out for our next divergence tracker, which is due out in the next couple of weeks. Catherine, do you agree with all of this? <clears throat> I'll come yeah, back to 
Yeah, it, it's nice to hear them singing from the same song sheet. Who'd have thought that might have happened um, maybe um, 18 months ago? Um, but it's a slightly, dare I say it, uh, desultory song sheet, because the fact is, although uh, Lindsay very helpfully said um, that we should be maximising the impact from the TCA, it is worth remembering that the TCA actually doesn't have a lot of impact. Um, I mean, it was a pretty thin um, zero, zero, zero tariff, zero quota trade deal, very good for the EU in respect of goods and pretty terrible for the UK in respect of services. And um, and it's the services sector which is squealing a lot about the TCA. And so I think um, just if you look at it from uh, that perspective, you can, and this is where your question, Alan, was helpful. Is this a stable equilibrium? You might say, is that it? Is this as good as it's going to get? Because there are things that absolutely aren't working. I've said services. Um, but also, we know that for those who are trying to export into the EU, uh, the fact that there's no conformity assessment is really making life difficult. And the other thing that we are seeing in a way that was never properly discussed um, during the referendum campaign is the Brussels effect. And major pieces of EU legislation um, are being adopted. A good example is the Digital Services Act, over which we have no say, but will have really quite significant impact um, on uh, our online platforms. Um, and we're also seeing that um, the announcement came out just before Christmas that we're not proposing to make significant any further changes about SPS measures. Makes a whole lot of sense in respect of dealing with the Northern Ireland border. But on the other hand, we are essentially be, being and still continue to be bound by EU rules over which we have very little influence. One other point, of course, we're talking about the EU-UK relations, but of course, in reality, it's also UK relations with the 28 or 27. Um, and um, some are better than others, and some are more enthusiastic about implementing the border between the UK and, for example, Spain uh, than others, which make day-to-day -day trade arrangements difficult for um, importers. Pedro, sorry, I cut you off before. No, no, not at all. I, I was going to say that I uh, it was my turn to agree with, with Lindsay, basically. <laughs> Um, uh, but, you know, um, uh, you can never say this is it and, and, and things won't move. Life is uh, is what it is and, and it changes. And, um, you know, a, a country that was a member of the European Union stopped being a member of the European Union um, and, and God knows what, what lies ahead. Uh, uh, and uh, we know that we have very important challenges ahead. So it's difficult to say, you know, uh, this is it, and it will be so for the end of time. But I, uh, but I do think we do have a very solid uh, framework now. But a solid framework, and I was listening to Catherine when she was um, uh, outlining some of the, let's say, lacuna maybe in this solid framework, depends on what you compare it to. And of course, if you compare it to when the UK was a member of the European Union, yes, there are many things that the UK was able to do, and many ways it was able to operate which are no longer there. So if you compare it to that, yes, you will find that there are things that are missing. But it was very clear also uh, that the United Kingdom did not want to remain within uh, the customs union, did not want to remain part of the single market, did not want to reach agreements on, um, uh, on, on, on free movement of, of, of people. And, and so um, we have tailored uh, a relationship in accordance with uh, those political choices that were made uh, uh, with the UK. Having said this, if you compare this relationship with other uh, third countries' relationship, and I'm not talking about those that are members of the EAS, uh, but uh, it's a third country relationship, we have probably one of the most ambitious um, FTAs that 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 we have uh, ever entered in, into, uh, which also has you know the standard um, uh, provisions um, uh, on on services that other FTAs uh, have. And, uh, and it is an ambitious uh, framework and, and it is proving its worth. I don't think it's irrelevant. I think it is very relevant. Imagine that we didn't have those clauses and where we would be in terms of, of, of trade and where we'd be also in terms of, of anything, of including, uh, including uh, agreements that we have reached uh, uh, for, for, uh, for, for visits, short-term visits of our citizens uh, that are totally fine and unhindered on, on both sides. So, and, and we could go on and start um, just um, this depicting how the different parts of the TCA are extremely relevant 
uh, be it energy, fisheries, trade, um, cooperation on police uh, and judiciary matters. Um, I mean, uh, all these are not irrelevant uh, uh, elements. They are uh, an essential part of the relationship. If you go to energy, and Lindsay was referring to this, we have an excellent cooperation on energy security. And, and how important is that um, uh, when we have faced the challenges that we are currently or that we have faced in in, in, in moving uh, away from sources uh, of, of, of energy that Russia used to provide to some European uh, member states. And here, the cooperation with the UK has been uh, vital. And we also provide in the EU a very important uh, um, uh, energy security to, to the UK. And we, we have very important dialogue. So, which, and, and I could go on in other aspects of, of the agreement that I believe are extremely relevant um, for the, the citizens, um, um, again, uh, it, you cannot compare it to what it was uh, being a member of the European Union. Now, of course, uh, if you're not a member of the European Union, you don't have a say in the laws and decisions that are taken in the European Union. Uh, so uh, so that's quite natural. Uh, but I do think that we have a very, very solid framework that allows us to move forward uh, in a confident manner and continue, as Lindsay was saying, uh, developing a strong uh, uh, relationship of partnership and facing together uh, challenges. Thank you. I have to say, like Catherine, uh, one of the ways in which the Brexit process scarred me is that sense of shock when the UK and the EU are on the same side. I remember it most vividly when the withdrawal agreement was finally signed, that you'd had all those months and months and months of really quite bad tempered argument. And then to suddenly see the two sides emerge and say, we both think this document's really good. And I'm getting a sort of slight sense of deja vu about this uh, now. But let me, let me pose one question where I think there might be a slight difference of emphasis on the two sides. Insofar as there are more things we can do, is it the case that we should be or will be doing them with individual member states rather than with the Commission as a whole? That's the same when we're talking about things like mobility, things like mutual recognition of qualifications. It strikes me that the British government is quite keen to do those with national capitals rather with, than with Brussels. Is that is that true, Lindsay? Um. So um, I think what, what the reality around that is simply that the competence arrangements between the EU and its member states are quite complicated. And they're complicated when you're in the EU. They're quite complicated when you're outside the EU looking in. And so I think the answer on, on issues like mobility is it depends what you're trying to achieve with a mobility agreement. And it depends where the competence actually lies. It's absolutely true that on mobility, we think that the kinds of mobility agreements that we have with countries like Australia and Canada, we think those could provide a way of uh, taking the relationship forward with individual member states. Mm -hmm. The EU has been discussing that on its side, as it has every right to do. And it thinks, I think it's fair to say, that there is probably greater potential on some issues if you do an EU-level agreement. We are not necessarily convinced that that's the right step forward at, at, at this point in time. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think there are issues where it's, it's easier to pursue things with member states, and the EU would kind of accept that. That's where the balance of competence is lies but there are also issues where the eu obviously has a choice whether it acts individually or it acts collectively and its views about that will will vary but i mean i think you're right um just to sort of return to, to catherine but also the point about you know is this sort of outbreak of sort of uh, agreeing on everything i don't think either pedro or i would sort of want want anybody to misunderstand it. Of course, there are areas of difference. Uh, there are areas of difference as we regulate fisheries in slightly different ways. There are areas of difference about the kinds of regulation that we're producing in different uh, areas. So, for example, we've gone ahead with gene editing as an, as an area of, of one of the sort of um, legislative changes that the EU is considering but hasn't yet come forward with a proposal on. So what we are certainly going to get is quite a lot of differences of policy which operate across both the sort of visible border, either of people and goods, or the more invisible border around some of the services issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and those create frictions. There's no doubt about that. Uh, it just depends where, A, where the EU is 
wants the relationship to go in certain areas of kind of what you might call sort of economic coordination and equally where the UK wants wants to move move the relationship forward it's the nature of it I think that because those economic and people interactions are so intense people on both sides will have a real interest on that and I think one of the really positive things actually the last year or so is that the EU has been taking a bit more interest in what it wants out of the relationship in the longer term and mobility is one of the areas that I think the EU has highlighted that it is interested in in developing links a bit more thanks okay Pedro on that question of sort of individual member states versus the European Commission if I can put it that way I think Lindsay provided a very good reply uh, oh lord uh, <laughs> I, 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 we're going to make you sick I guess <laughs> I'm sorry about that but but it's true uh, the, the reality is that uh, um, uh, competences um, uh, there are uh, commission competence or EU competences and our member states competence it's true there are areas of mixed competence and they're called like that actually mixed competence and depending on what we want to achieve, you have to address yourself more to uh, the institutions and the EU itself, or you address yourself more to uh, to member states. And it is also true that over the years, uh, the, the competences at EU level have increased enormously, and even competences that are not strictly at EU level, you find interest in dealing with them at EU level. And I, I would say health, uh, and Lindsay was referring to this uh, a moment ago, health was is one of those competences where we've discovered um, in, in the COVID crisis uh, that uh, the greater coordination and working together amongst member states is uh, of benefit for the whole EU. And we've been able to deal with that crisis much more effectively because we've dealt with it um, together. So depending on, on the issue, you will have to see whether you have greater advantage to address yourself to the EU or to uh, member states. Um, there, there is an old tradition. I'm not saying that the UK in any way uh, attempts to do this. No, there is an old tradition uh, from, from third states in dealing with the, and I'll give you some spice, uh, dealing with uh, the EU um, uh, to, uh, to try to deal with member states instead of the EU. Uh, uh, because they think dealing with individual member states, especially if you go to big member states, you're able to uh, sway the EU into one direction or another. Now, I have not detected this in any visible way uh, in, in, in the year and, and, and a few months that I've, I've been here, uh, but, uh, but that, is, uh, um, that is always um, something that we, we, we look for. Uh, um, and we were uh, watchful for rather, uh, and uh, uh, but again, I haven't I have detected any anything not in any case in, in a way that anyone would consider uh, uh, undue or unfair. Um, so um, so um, uh, on on mobility, uh, this is indeed an, an interesting uh, question, and it's true that uh, member states could decide individually on mobility uh, um, issues. At the same time, there are a number of of, of issues regarding um, uh, the um, uh, the, uh, the the stay of uh, of uh, non EU citizens within the EU uh, that are relevant at at EU level. We have also a Schengen uh, agreement um, that is uh, very uh, relevant. So. Um, um, so and, and and here, I think the jury is still out on on this issue of mobility, whether it's of greater interest to deal with it at uh, EU level or um, uh, at individual member states. We think within the EU that there, there is an interest to having a framework at EU level. We're discussing this with member states, and we'll continue this discussing this discussion because one of the things actually that I think most people, citizens, be it in the UK or the EU, may miss uh, of present arrangements is a greater facility of uh, exchanges amongst our societies that 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 was the case before mm -hmm. uh, while the UK was part of the EU and that now in different situations has become a bit more complex. And we're particularly interested in youth mobility. We think it's uh, of uh, extreme importance that the youth both in the UK and the EU continue um, uh, engaging uh, strongly and continue forging this sense of common European uh, identity. Um, which uh, is very much aligned with the need to defend uh, common European interests, which I referred to earlier. So, um, but all this, I think, is being dealt with in a, in a very civilized and 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 uh, transparent and friendly manner. Okay, excellent. Just before we go on, Pedro, you seem to be on my screen twice. Oh, uh, and I'm getting a slight degree of echo that might be from you. So I'm wondering. 
either if you can get rid of the second you oh. <laughs> or if you can just mute yourself when you're not talking because i think that might get rid of the echo for now i mean don't worry about it it's not it's not terrible um, uh, i will mute myself yes okay i mean actually i'm about to come straight back to you so this might <laughs> Is, 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 is it, just based on what you what you just said, I'm sorry, Pedro, to make you unmute yourself immediately, but you must have been quite interested in what the mayor of London was saying over the weekend in the Financial Times then about youth mobility. It sounded like, in essence, he was saying what you just said, that there is a real interest and appetite in allowing those uh, trips and those visits to happen. And it must be something that we we look to doing. Were you were you quite pleased to see what he was saying? Sorry. Uh, uh, do you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, uh, you know, it's uh, we 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 think that it is good uh, to consider um, youth mobility. We have to see what would be the modalities of this. So the devil is always in the detail. Yeah. And then, of course, uh, what we need is a, is a position at, at government level that will uh, um, uh, that will determine what is the, that the government wants to to go. I think. Um, all voices indicating that um, that they see positive elements in youth mobility, uh, we will receive, uh, um, I think, uh, very positively because that's the way we we look at this. So, um, but again, the modalities and how it is done uh, needs to be examined in in in, uh, in in detail. And I'm sure that that this is an issue that at some point, and I think not in a very distant uh, future, it's an issue that is in which we're going to be able to make additional progress. I do wish so. I think our, our societies on both sides want it. And when societies on both sides want it, then at the end, um, um, political and administrative structures that serve those societies usually end up giving them what they want. But maybe I'm misreading uh, <laughs> UK society. Uh, I, I, I think from what I hear from uh, EU society, that I think I've, I've definitely reflected accurately uh, the interest in, in, in facilitating youth mobility. Okay, Catherine, do you want to come in on this? Uh, so mobility is clearly the vexed issue. I think there's quite a lot of appetite around youth mobility, not least because um, we have it in other uh, programs. And then there's a question about how you define youth. Um, for some of us, we might define it up to about the age of 60, which would cover most of us. Um, but um, certainly wearing my academic hat, really important for um, uh, young people to be able to travel and actually to be able to do, for example, um, exchange programs uh, without um, having to get visas. And it's particularly problematic uh, for, uh, for example, young French people want to come to the UK and um, having to bear really quite significant visa costs. But that is only part of the story. Um, if we're talking about economic mobility and service provision, uh, the provisions in the TCA on um, what's called mode four, um, mobility, which is mobility of natural persons, are really very thin indeed. They are not much better than what's in GATS, the General Agreement on Trade and Services. And uh, that means that for a lot of business travel, which is more than a few days, particularly where someone's going to get paid um, in the host country, it is in fact very difficult to use the provisions in the TCA. And so they have to get work permits in the host country. And that can take um, uh, a number of weeks um, and the processes and dare I say it in your native Spain, Pedro, for example, are immensely bureaucratic and all of this makes business travel just much more difficult. And it's that area where quite a lot more work um, needs to be done. And that's where there's much less consensus because you can quite well see that those who are in favour of advocating um, a more relaxed policy, for example, a 90 out of 180 day policy where you travel you can travel with visa free and work um, and be paid for 90 out of 180 days. Um, that could be portrayed as some sort of return to free movement, which would be deeply unpopular with certain parts of the British um, public. So I, I absolutely understand Lindsay's caution, um, but there would be space which is um, goes um, uh, some way to addressing some of the problems with the TCA. Brilliant. Thank you. We've got an uh, absolute load of questions that I'm going to turn to in a moment. But one theme that has come up a lot that I just want to raise, I mean, it seems to me that 
cooperation between the UK and the EU on foreign and security policy, particularly in the context of Ukraine, has gone rather well. Uh, that we work together very closely, that we've managed to coordinate our efforts on things like sanctions remarkably well. Do you think that experience proves that Boris Johnson was right, that actually we don't really need a formalised security arrangement because we can make things work pretty well without one? I guess that's probably a question for me to start with, isn't it, Anna? I think that it shows that we're deeply aligned on foreign policy and can make it work with or without formal structures. I think that the degree of coordination, had we not faced such big international challenges, it's certainly true that it would have probably taken us a bit more time to have some of the discussions about these issues that we have had. Mm -hmm. I think that it is remarkable the degree of alignment on sanctions. So, for example, a good area to think about on sanctions is both the EU and the UK do trade in services sanctions against Russia. Now, that's quite a controversial area of sanctions. And I think the fact we're both doing it shows just how aligned our kind of sanctions regimes are. Um, so are we making the foreign policy relationship work? Yes, I think we are. Does the foreign policy relationship require, for example, six monthly meetings between the high representative and the British Foreign Secretary to make it work? Well, they meet, they talk to each other more often than that in any case. So, and we have, as I think probably people have seen, put together quite a, quite a lot of structure at kind of senior official level in an informal way to make sure that the lines of communication are always open. Um, so I think we've built a, we've built a sort of very successful non-treaty based arrangement. Would, if people want to come and look at some, making some of that issue more formally, I think that will be a sort of decision for politicians on both sides of the channels into the future. But I think genuinely we can all be very proud of what's been achieved the last few years. Pedro? Yeah, I, I, I agree with, with Lindsay. Um, oh. There's there's good uh, cooperation um, on foreign and security policy uh, issues. Um, uh, at the same time, it, could it be deeper and 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 wider? And uh, um, I think it could. Uh, and and uh, if we look at the relationship we have with other um, um, strategic partners for the European Union, uh, the United States, Canada, uh, Norway, um, we have more, let's say, structured and and formalized uh, relationship. Uh, we also have agreements with some of them that um, um, allow their participation in some of our um, defense uh, projects and programs um, uh, with the United States. I'm not sure whether we've finished, finalized it or not, but we were negotiating an administrative agreement with the European Defense Agency, for example. Um, and, and if there is an area where I do think that uh, cooperation, and I will refer to, to actually to um, a statement uh, delivered by uh, Secretary of Defense Shops uh, um, uh, a week ago, um, an area where we do have to do a lot of, of work together is defense and defense capability development probably. Um, uh, now, um, so, so there are areas where we could uh, um, enhance our, our cooperation uh, in, uh, in um, defense, security, uh, and, and foreign affairs. Um, um, and uh, it's true as well that the fact that we're working together under the G7 is providing also a forum where we have uh, enhanced cooperation. Then most of, uh, a lot of the cooperation we did for uh, the preparation and 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 follow up uh, on the support to Ukraine. We were doing things also in uh, in G seven uh, format. Uh, mm -hmm. We've done also a lot of things uh, working together in uh, in quasi NATO formats. I would say so. Um, so we have other formats that are let's say also supplying us with uh, with more regular possibilities of exchanges which are always good but but Lindsay is fundamentally right in the sense that we have very fluid exchanges and and uh, between our our officials uh, last week we had here our managing director for um uh, for um eastern europe and ukraine and and there's constant flow of uh, of uh, visitors i think um, um both to uh, Brussels and 
and also from Brussels to, to London. And but it is the case, isn't it, Pedro, that one of the reasons why there's a there's a relative lack of cooperation on, say, procurement and arms manufacturing is because of the way the Europeans have defined strategic autonomy, that actually it makes it very, very difficult. And sometimes, I mean, and, and sometimes as a Brit, it's hard to avoid a slight jarring when you hear all the talk about what close allies we are and how we said we face shared threats and how we have to work together. And yet we're excluded from some of these economic aspects of security. Or do you just think I'm being unfair? Of course, yes, I think you're being unfair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and and first, I'm very glad that you said there's a definition of strategic autonomy. <laughs> you have to tell me which is that agreed definition of strategic autonomy, because this has been a matter of debate, um, a very academic debate, I may say so. Um, I think if you go to for, for many, many years, actually, since um, security and defense policy was launched in the, the year 2000, uh, and there has been, to my knowledge, no uh, clear agreement on a definition of strategic autonomy. Um, uh, but I do think that most of our mechanisms uh, foresee uh, entry doors, uh, be it for uh, companies of, of other countries, but as well as for um, uh, as for cooperation in joint uh, projects. And some of our NATO partners are participating in some of these uh, projects. Now, you may think the door is not big enough or it's... Uh, Whatever, but it, there is a door, and there is cooperation. There are cooperation uh, uh, possibilities. Um, so it's a matter of, of looking at those and seizing them. The cooperation in defense, by the way, is not particularly an unsensitive issue. It is very mm -hmm. sensitive in each and every country, and each and every country um, uh, protects its uh, cooperation or, or or includes a number of safeguards in that cooperation. So it would be very odd for the European Union not to include safeguards. Uh, on on projects it is uh, um, it is uh, um, uh, financing or uh, sponsoring. So okay. yes, we've developed a number of mechanisms throughout the years, and in all those mechanisms, we have opened doors for uh, partners. Lindsay, if at any point you want to openly disagree with Pedro, just put your hand up, and I will gladly. Oh, are you going now? Um. Well, I mean, I think that is right. We are yet. I think. It's quite difficult to tell how open some of those doors really are um, and whether they're meaningful. And this was the challenge, actually, when we looked at the proposals that the EU put forward during the TCA negotiations. We weren't entirely sure that they really were going to substantively change the defence relationship. And if the US does manage to agree an administrative arrangement with the EGA, that will be, it will be interesting to see what actually comes out of that. I think the bigger point, really, though, is defence is an example of a highly strategic in industry where we might find ourselves fragmented across allies with barriers between us or not fragmented across allies with barriers between us. And that, I think, over the next 5, 10, 15 years, that's the big challenge facing the yeah. West, is how do we use legitimate national security uh, interests how do we build the tools that allow us to cooperate with each other, but but don't involve our sensitive technologies leaking all the way to our opponents in China and, and Russia? And that, that's going to be a difficult dilemma for all of us. And if we get that dynamic wrong, then we will end up with fragmented industries. And that won't be good for the UK. I would say it also probably wouldn't be good for the EU, at least in a number of these areas. Thank you. Catherine, sorry, I'm not coming to you enough. Sorry. No, I just wanted to say two things. One, I mean, in the area of defence security cooperation, it's always been largely intergovernmental, even when we we're in the EU. So this is perhaps not surprising that in the post-Brexit world, um, it continues in much the same vein. It's a fairly comfortable uh, shoe that can be fitted. Um, but what I would say is we know that the EU has made huge strides in respect of um, uh, its cooperation amongst itself in respect to defence matters in respect of Ukraine. It's been less impressive, it must be said, over the Israel-Gaza situation. And it'd be interesting to know whether Pedro might agree with that. And the other point I would make is that, of course, the other format that has not been discussed yet uh, for cooperation would be the EPC. And the interesting question is, um, we're meant to be hosting that um, soon. There's a very fine, very fine article in the FT which features um, Professor Menon. Um, is it going to take place? And uh, if so, when? 
I suppose that might be one for you, Lindsay, to start with, unless you want to pass. No, that's fine. I okay. mean, it's uh, the reality of that is it's just to, when you look at the international calendar, it's a very busy six months. You know, we've got the Washington summit. The European Council has a quite, I think it's fair to say, Pedro, quite a few European councils on its agenda over the next six months. And the discussions we're having with partners are when do we organise a summit so that it can really add value because we're committed to the format of the EPC, but we need to show on an ongoing basis that the meetings are a success and deliver good quality outcomes. Um, and so that's the kind of discussion we're having. We're have it, we're being we're we're talking to our allies in the European Union and outside about what would work best for everyone, but we haven't come to we haven't reached a conclusion on that yet. Um, are we perfectly capable of, of hosting a summit in the, the next uh, three or four months to answer Anand's question uh, earlier? I, I think we are. It's just that we want to make sure that it's useful for everyone. Thanks. I'm just clinging to this vision of a leader's WhatsApp group and a doodle poll as a way of organising this. <laughs> Pedro. Yeah, no, on, on, uh, just, I wanted to, to respond to one of the questions that were raised by, by Lindsay, and, and, uh, and I think he's right saying that, uh, um, that one of the big risks in defense um, uh, amongst allies is fragmentation of the industry. And, and that's absolutely true. And, but I would say and argue that the efforts that the European Union has been conducting in the last years have aimed precisely at, at, uh, at overcoming, uh, partially at least, uh, that, that fragmentation. And I think probably it's the most ambitious effort, multilateral effort that has been undertaken in the last few years to overcome uh, that fragmentation, of course, and uh, as he acknowledged, this is an area we all know how sensitive it is, and and uh, and the need to and that and in most countries uh, the the kind of safeguards they they try to introduce to protect uh, technology and and avoid that it goes in the wrong hands. But nevertheless, um, there's been a valiant effort out there on the EU side, and I think it's worthwhile acknowledging this. On our cooperation, I, I didn't understand very well what, what Catherine was what wanted to say on, on um, certainly in the European Union, we've been coordinating and, and coordinating, we've been responding in a very united manner on, on Ukraine. And actually in the Middle East, despite uh, the, the noise that is made um, uh, on, on potential disagreements, I think there's very clear agreement on, on the fact that uh, first we acknowledge the right of defense of Israel, uh, we say that this defense has to be proportionate and uh, uh, it has to um, to be in line with uh, with the commitments, international commitments and respect for human rights. Uh, of course, we've condemned in the strongest term the horrible um, uh, attacks of, of Hamas, that goes without saying. But then we say if we want to move towards solutions, we have to do it on the basis of a two-state solution. And I don't think there's anyone within the European Union that is uh, member states of the European Union that challenges uh, that that assertion and and so that's um, and there was an interesting uh, good foreign affairs council yesterday precisely on this and and I do hope that uh, this uh, clear message was um, uh, and uh, that this message came out um, clearly enough and there is a big effort on the side of the high representative to try to introduce some uh, um, um, positive dynamics into creating a, a, a political uh, process that will help us overcome the, the present situation, move from a situation of, of war and where uh, very heavy casualties are, 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 are taking place to a situation where we can see peace and, and a, a path towards uh, peace. And I think that's, that's what the European Union is trying to do. And I don't think it differs at all with what the UK is trying to do. I think we're very much aligned as well. In, in that kind of uh, reasoning and alignment. On EPC, I think uh, uh, we uh, this is a very uh, useful uh, uh, instrument to engage at pan-European uh, level. It's fully supported by, by the European Union. Uh, and uh, and uh, we have agreed to have two um, summits a year. Um, so even if uh, there are many, as Lindsay was saying, European councils foreseen, because it will be, uh, there are many challenges uh, uh, at EU level and, and, and also um, electoral um, uh, rendezvous uh, that make these challenges even more, more pressing. Um, so European Council will be uh, very active. Actually, it has increased um, constantly in activity ever since it was created, I would say. 
but uh, but I'm sure that uh, European uh, uh, Union leaders and the leaders of member states um, would be very happy to uh, to attend the DPC and are looking forward uh, to um, um, to the, the convening of this meeting by by the UK. As you know, there will be a second one already foreseen uh, for the second half of the year. Okay, I've been really good this year in getting to audience questions and getting through them, and I've been utterly rubbish today. So what I'm going to do is turn to some of the questions that have come in. Uh, if we can keep our answers quite brief, because there are loads of them, and I'm feeling a bit bad that we're not going to get to all of them, but a lot of them are about the future, I should say, and there are a lot of them around the broad theme of what canons should we expect from the review of the TCA that is due in 2526? Um, well, can I start with that? You can. I think that in, to an extent, it's better to talk about what do we want to do with the relationship and what role does a TCA review play in that? Okay. Because you wouldn't want necessarily to wait to do anything that you thought was useful until you had a TCA review. And as Pedro, I think I anticipate, may say in his response, I think the, the EU side doesn't see the TCA review as a sort of big opportunity to put every question back on the table, but sees it a bit more as a technical exercise. So I think what we will have, our political cycles are kind of aligned uh, in the sense that we have elections this year and the EU side has elections this year. I think that means that from a UK perspective, we will have a, a new government, whether it's Conservative or Labour, at approximately the same time. Uh, depending on when you think the election will actually be, uh, as the EU. And I think that's a sensible time to take stock about where we got to in the relationship. We tidy things up along the way in the meantime. We keep working on some of the issues we've been talking about. But then, you know, leaders will decide how to take forward the relationship. And I think some of the issues that we've been talking about, whether it's migration, whether it's uh, mobility, whether it's foreign policy, all of that is potentially things that, that leaders might want to talk about and that might form part of the next stage of EU-UK cooperation. Um, how much of that is about a thing called a TCA review, I think will depend on what both sides want to do. Thanks. Okay. Pedro. Well, I, I think definitely the TCA has uh, is a, a relatively new agreement. We are in its uh, beginning, its fourth year of implementation, um, uh, and and actually, what is foreseen in the TCA is its uh, review after five years, meaning twenty twenty six, the review of its implementation, and not necessarily and and uh, we're going to do something altogether different, nor are we going to start negotiating things that we haven't negotiated before. So that's very clear on on the EU side. We have to see how um, uh, the, the 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 implementation of the treaty continues to unfold. And as I was saying at the beginning, uh, we are rather encouraged by um, a very positive um, implementation of of the treaty so far. That is covering a large part of uh, of, of of the needs of uh, of both uh, uh, societies within the European Union and the United Kingdom. Having said that, I, I, I would agree that uh, on issues like uh, foreign uh, common security policy or other uh, issues that may become um, pressing, of course, leaders are going to look at them as they come. And of course, they will have to take decisions um, as they come, uh, whether this implies a treaty or treaty revision, not necessarily. We're talking about uh, um, uh, a cooperation on, on common foreign security policy. To my knowledge, we've never done this through a treaty uh, or, 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 or maybe um, at least we can do it without a treaty. You can have, depending of course, the definition of the treaty, maybe then we, we enter a legal discussion here with Catherine. Um, uh, but uh, but we could have any kind of um, joint statement or, uh, I mean, there can be different formats in which you can uh, reach uh, uh, agreements. We're also discussing mobility uh, right now, as, as we were saying at the beginning with, uh, uh, with the UK. So there are a number of things that can be done uh, that do not require uh, necessarily, um, certainly not a revision of the TCA, which I don't think right now is, is in the minds of, of European Union uh, leadership. Uh, but that can nevertheless uh, be, be dealt with as the situation uh, arises. 
Okay, thank Catherine. Just to bring you in, I mean, the, well, listening to those two, it does strike me partly a that well, mainly that what Labour are saying seems slightly more ambitious than that, and Labour indeed are talking specifically about a new security policy treaty. Do you think they're misreading the room a bit? They might be, but what we can say is that if you just look at Article 776, which is the provision on the review, um, it just talks about review of implementation. Now, there's a fantastic UK and a Changing Europe report which looks at the possible spectrum um, of God, the meanings good. of the word uh, implementation. It can range from a little light dusting to a much more fundamental reform. And of course, the, the, the big question for Labour, assuming, or if it is a Labour government that does get in, is whether they have done enough of the pitch rolling, ground laying, to um, go for the more, uh, persuade the EU to accept the more ambitious end um, of the uh, crucial noun implementation and review of implementation. At the moment, we know um, uh, Shevkovic made it very clear um, before Christmas that the EU has um, unambitious objectives, but all of that might change with the politics changing. I think what was really helpful from what Lindsay has just been saying is that our election cycles are aligned and things may look very different um, later in the year and possibly even if there is a Trump presidency too. For those of you who don't know Catherine, she literally walks about with a copy of the TCA in her bag and used to walk around with a bottle of cassis as well so she could talk about European Court of Justice jurisprudence with props. So that is the sort of lawyer we are dealing with here. Uh, so just, I mean, we have to ask this question, I think. Do either, well, any of you, do any of you think that should Donald Trump be re-elected, that fundamentally changes the nature of the game. And we talk, you know, we've hinted before at, you know, common security challenges, common threats can make us work together quicker than would otherwise be the case. It's not inconceivable. You don't need to speculate on this, but it's not inconceivable that a Trump presidency uh, is disruptive for NATO. Uh, is do, do either of you see the possibility of that leading to the rules of the game in UK EU relations shifting? Do either of you want to answer that question? Um, well, sort of instinctively, not very much, I am, to be honest. But I think <laughs> what, what I really think the answer to that question is, is we will continue to see our relationships with the European Union and the US through a prism of what delivers successful European and transatlantic security. It will continue to be the case that we will see the US as an essential partner for that. It's simply mm -hmm. the case that we don't think transatlantic defence works or should be made to work or could work without the US. So I think under any scenario, what we will be trying to do is identify ways that we can make that transatlantic and European defence stronger and more consistent as it faces a new new era of sort of threats and we all know that as democracies we should be able to raise our game on that it is currently not as impressive as it could be how we are collectively dealing with an economy which is significantly smaller than our combined weight you know we need to we need to bring our economic weight and and the tools that we have to bear and I think what that will mean is that both the EU relationship and the US relationship will remain important, and we will genuinely continue to invest in both. Just inspired by the very diplomatic uh, re reply that, that Lindsay has just given. Um, uh, the of, course, <laughs> of course, we, we, we don't know um, whether uh, Trump will win the presidential election, and we don't even know what... Um, the, a president, a new President Trump would be doing. What we do know is that the United States is a very important partner um, uh, for the UK, for the EU as well. And that will not uh, change. It will remain a very important partner. And I think we all look at the transatlantic relationship as uh, a, an essential piece of uh, uh, the security that we built in, in, in Europe. We also believe that Europe and uh, is an essential piece of overall uh, world security. And it's in the interest, of course, of the European, of the United States also to 
um, remain uh, engaged uh, with uh, with Europe and with the European Union in particular, because the European Union is at the end the vertebral column of security, prosperity, and democracy in in Europe. So um, so that that's very clear. Um, I also think that the last years have also shown that uh, the uh, relationship with the UK is is and the relationship between the UK and the EU is also key for security in Europe. And I have no doubt uh, that uh, we're going to continue strengthening that relationship uh, throughout uh, uh, the coming uh, years. Catherine? I would just I would I would disagree. I would say that I think what we have learned um, both from a, the previous Trump presidency and even now under Biden is the Americans are losing their taste for multilateralism. You see that in the WTO. You see the fact that uh, the WTO dispute resolution mechanism is just not working. Um, but um, given that multilateralism, I think, may have had its day. The risk is that the UK feels very much out in the cold if the Trump president looks increasingly looks out looks increasingly in on itself, and therefore the attraction of actually being firmly rooted within another entity, i.e., the EU, not as a member but um, as some form of adjunct um, in some sort of adjunct relationship, which is deeper than what we've got under the TCA, um, becomes more appealing. Interesting. I mean, going back to where we started uh, with this notion of stable equilibrium, and I suppose this is mainly for Pedro and Catherine. I mean, if you want to chip in, Lindsay, you're welcome to, but you're welcome to sit it out. It, it looks likely from the polls in this country that we're going to get a new government, and it looks likely that that will be a Labour government, and Labour have made some commitments about renegotiating things with the European Union. They talked about an SPS agreement, mutual recognition of conformity assessment, of professional qualifications. Is there appetite on the EU side for that sort of negotiation, Pedro? Well, I would not call that a renegotiation of the TCA. First, the, oh, uh, right. the recognition of, of uh, qualifications is even foreseen within the TCA. So it's um, no problem there. That's something. That's why I said the TCA is, is quite a broad uh, uh, um, uh, agreement. In that, uh, and, and we've always also been rather favorable to uh, or, or responded positively to the possibility of, of agreement, an SPS type of agreement, which we think uh, uh, may um, facilitate um, uh, trade. So these are things in which uh, the European Union has already expressed itself positively in the past. Of course, um, an SPS agreement um, uh, entails uh, uh, modalities uh, that, um, well, let's see whether the UK um, is interested in those modalities or not, because it would entail probably a dynamic alignment and, and things of the sort. But again, um, no one has um, uh, yet put anything like this formally on the table. And I think uh, if it's put formally on the table, uh, um, um, and let, uh, we'll have to see what the new leadership of the European Union wishes to do with it. But in the past, there has been interest in an SPS agreement. And, and there has been also, uh, and, and the, as I was saying, the other example you gave, it's part of the TCA. So there are many things that can be done within the TCA itself. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think if you want, uh, Lindsay, but don't feel you have to, Catherine. I think I would add that um, I think Labour is somewhat guilty of cakeism in and of itself. Labour um, is talking about um, making the UK one of the most, most successful dynamic economies. And the only way that will really shift that dial is to rejoin the single market and the customs union. And that is not on the table. And so all the talk about SPS agreements and mutual recognition of um, qualifications good, nice, particularly the SPS agreement, which will help things on the Northern Ireland border. But the fact is, it will not make a significant impact on um, growth. And so the question that facing Labour is how far are they prepared to go? In my um, estimation, probably not very far in the first term. They've been so scarred by the Brexit process. Thank you. So, I mean, just trying to find a way of, of summing this up. I mean, it's quite clear that there is a degree of consensus between the UK and the EU sides uh, on the workings of the TCA and so on. It's, I mean, just from a, an outside perspective, as someone who who makes a living from gossiping about these things rather than actually do them in practice, uh, you know, the, the sort of tension between the sort of swirling noise of the commentary around Brexit and its economic impacts and the relative equanimity with which you both have discussed this uh, relationship has been... 
quite striking. But uh, we've just, I've taken us through to two o'clock. That was the point of me waffling on like that to our end point, our natural end point, because we didn't have time for another question. But uh, can I just say, I mean, Pedro and Lindsay in particular, thank you so much for doing this. I know that sometimes you must approach these sorts of things with a sinking heart, wondering what sort of impossible questions that you can't answer are going to be uh, posed to you. But you've been brilliant and it's really, really kind of you to have taken part. For those watching, I hope you've enjoyed it. I'm sorry I've been so rubbish at getting to your questions. I promise to do better next time. Uh, talking about next time, on the 31st of January, we have a big and really impressive, if I say so myself, conference on the state of the UK economy, which you can sign up to either in person here in London or online. Some really, really top quality economists dissecting what the state of the UK economy and what it is and what its prospects might be. So look forward to seeing many of you at that. And for the moment, thank you all so much, particularly Pedro and Lindsay, and of course you, Catherine, as ever. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Bye bye.